How is everybody today? Fantastic. Y'all look amazing. Give yourselves a round of applause. You look wonderful. <laughs> I uh, Just a special thank you to Donnie. I, I took a picture. I've got my wife and my daughter with me this morning. I normally come solo, but I took a little picture with my daughter, and I sent it to Donnie, and I just said thank you for trusting me uh, to share my heart with the family here at Macedonia. So thank you guys. Before we dive in, um, I want to share a quick story that's not related at all to what I'm talking about today, but it was just really powerful for me as Jake was leading worship here, that last song, I thought was a beautiful rendition of a traditional hymn, How Marvelous, How Wonderful. And um, I've had the unique privilege over the last three years uh, of serving in a role as a, I guess you would call it a chaplain, um, at a nursing home that is right around the corner from my house. And they call it Prayer Circle. And so I, I have the, the, the honor to go in and I meet with um, usually as few as four, as many as 20 um, elderly folks who are at Bradley Creek Nursing Home. And it, it's really been one of the most humbling experiences in my life because I've, I've watched a number of them pass away and I've gotten to know them and I've sat with their family as they've passed away. And it's a really special thing to me. But one of the things that's most amazing is a lot of these folks are suffering from cognitive issues and things like that. But it continues to amaze me that when we get together, I will put on an old hymn and they know every word. And it's wild because they, they can't remember the story they told me two minutes ago, but they can sing every word to how marvelous how wonderful. And I think about this concept, right, of, of that's just been something that they've done for years. They've heard these songs. They've sang these songs. And when they hear the music, they come alive in just a special way. And so as I heard that old familiar hymn, it just, it, it reminded me that those words have probably been sang in this uh, building for a number of years. And it was just a familiar thing. And so it was just a special moment. I recognized the Holy Spirit's presence in it. And I just wanted to share that with you guys. And, you know, it certainly blessed me. So before we get into today's message, um, I want to have a quick, quick word of prayer and then we'll dive in, okay? Father God, we pause at this moment and we just set down everything in our lives, in our minds, in our hearts that may be hindering us from experiencing you in greater measure and in greater detail. God, we recognize you speak in big things. You speak in small things. And so today, my heart asks that you would speak exactly how you need to speak, that everyone who is here would be met and encountered by the living God in such a profound way that they would not leave this place unchanged. Father, today, give me the capacity through the Spirit to communicate your heart for your people, your heart for the world around us, and bring yourself into greater, uh, a greater picture in our own mind and our heart so that we can grab hold of you even more. And I ask all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Um, Every time I preach, uh, I feel like I have a whiteboard and a bunch of paint, and I just start splashing stuff up there. And by the time I'm done, I hope there's a picture that we can look at and go, oh, that makes sense. And sometimes it looks more like Picasso, and you're like, I don't know where the abstractness was going. But I have so much to say about today's passage from John 5. And, you know, the, the title, it was Scott asked me for a title, and I was like, man, don't do that to me. I was like, I don't know a title. I said, but let's call it, um, Do You Want to Be Healed? And that's the words we're going to hear from Jesus here in John 5. But as I unpack this, we're going to read the scripture and then probably reread it and go through, and I'm going to be throwing stuff all around, okay? So hang with me, and hopefully by the end we'll have a nice picture that we can um, grab hold of. So let's dive together here into John 5. And, and, and let's just read verses 1 through, I think it's 18. All right. So after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem, by the sheep gate, a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, Blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. 
When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, take your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath, and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, The man who healed me, that man said to me, Take up your bed and walk. And they asked him, Who is the man that said that to you? Take up your bed and walk. Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. But afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed them, healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. And this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Okay? That was the ESV, um, John 5, 1 through um, 18. Now... There, I see this passage of Scripture, and today is going to be kind of really diving into the, the Scriptures and, and laying a few things out. I see it in parts and pieces. And so the way that I approach this Scripture and the way I want to do it today with you guys is to treat this kind of like the onion. And we're going to have the outer layer and then the center layer. And hopefully in the middle there's this gold nugget hiding in the middle of the onion that we can get down into. And I think a lot of times we look at this passage of Scripture and we think about the physical nature of what's going on here. Okay, so we're going to talk first about the physical nature. And then underneath that, the next layer is going to be the spiritual nature. And the gold nugget in the middle, I think, is the big picture that I really want to bring home here. So, a couple of things. When you're reading passages of Scripture like this, um, I believe that when they were writing the, the Scripture, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So when they put little details in there, the details matter tremendously. And all the details are are a little highlight, neon flashing light to say, hey, dive deeper here. Hey, dive deeper here. So there's a couple of things that jumped out to me immediately as I'm reading this that we're going to hang on to as our little dive deeper uh, neon sign. One is sheep gate. Hang on to that, okay? Pay attention to that. The next one, the man was lame for 38 years, okay? The other concept here is this idea of the water, okay? And, and, the, and the last piece of this is the Sabbath. So those are the four kind of areas. When I read this, the Holy Spirit is just going, hey, pay attention to this. Hey, pay attention to this. And so we're going to break this down as we go through these things. So Understanding the context of this, which, by the way, if y'all have ever seen The Chosen or have not seen The Chosen, you need to go online and you need to look up The Chosen, season two, I think it's episode four. This is acted out in a beautiful way that really brings it to life. Okay, so do make sure to do that for those watching online or watching the replay. Check out The Chosen. Uh, season two, episode four, I think it's two, four, um, is all about this. It may, be, it may be season four, episode two. But anyway, the man at the pool, you'll get there. Um, but hear me out here. Okay, so what's going on? Now, Jesus has already fed, the, I mean, not fed, but he's already done the wine, the water to wine situation. And then just recently before this, he's already healed someone. It's the second public miracle. So word about Jesus is starting to spread. Okay? And you're building this tension between Jesus and these religious leaders. So there's a stir going on in the community about Jesus. And so when it says that after this there was a feast of the Jews, what's this? This is like a Super Bowl party modern day. Okay, So you got all these people coming together, people are up at your house, and Jesus steps up into the middle of this and he disrupts the flow. 
So during these, these feasts, the traditional religious leaders are the ones with authority. They're the ones that are wanting to do the dog and the pony show. And Jesus shows up in the middle of this feast, and he heals this man that's laying by this pool. Okay, What's interesting about this pool is where the city of Jerusalem was laid out, the Sheep Gate is on the northeast corner of Jerusalem. And what's really interesting about this is this is where they would bring the sacrificial lambs through the sheep gate to the altar at the temple to be sacrificed. But on the way through the sheep gate, you have this pool that is called Bethesda. Okay, And what you have are all of the invalids, the lame, the blind, laying by the sheep gate. And so it's a pretty wild picture to consider. Now also consider Jesus has been through this gate many times. He's in this part of his ministry, probably 31, 32 years old. He's come in and through Jerusalem. We know this man's been there for 38 years, so it's interesting to consider that Jesus has actually probably passed by this man and these these folks before. But something's different right now where the timing of God is going to meet the needs of a man and you're going to watch a miracle of God happen. And so I think one of the things on the natural side of this and the physical side We want physical proof or healing in our own lives. And and yet sometimes it's hard for us to wrap our heads around that. And maybe we've prayed for someone who's been sick and they have passed away. Maybe we've prayed for a miracle and it hasn't happened. Well, think about this. This man had probably passed or encountered Jesus a number of times before the timing met up for the miracle to take place. And so a lot of times in the natural, when we want things to happen, it's simply a matter of the timing of God and the purposes of God are not necessarily in alignment. And so you have this pool and these invalids that are laying by. Now what you need to know about this, like physics, King Herod, who had really built that area out, had created these... uh, aqueduct systems that would transport water in the middle of the desert, and it was a pretty profound thing, and historians have unearthed all of this stuff. And so what was actually probably going on is when the aqueduct system would turn on, it would cause this pool to kind of stir up and bubble. Okay, It's kind of like if you got your, uh, your, your sink in your kitchen attached to your dishwasher and you hit the dishwasher button and it kind of bubbles up in the sink. You know what I mean? It's, that's what's going on. But the problem is, is these invalids, something had to have happened here that made them believe that the water was special. Because as soon as the water would bubble up, they thought it was an angel of the Lord that was stirring up the water. So they would all rush down the steps or roll down the steps or however they had to get down the steps or have somebody throw them in the water because they wanted to get healed because they thought healing was found in the water. I want you guys to hear me in this. There's a lot of things in your life and in my life that we're looking to for healing. And we're looking at this situation or this thing that we believe is going to bring us the healing that we need. And so every time we have this opportunity, we're going to get close to that thing which we believe is going to bring us our healing. It can be physically, it can be a doctor. It could be a financial situation with some type of financial advisor. It could be a a self-help five-point book or whatever. But we have these things in our mind that we are trusting to heal us. And so we've heard, oh, it helped so-and-so. So so I'm going to put myself in the position to be around this pool of water when it bubbles up because I want to be healed. Y'all following me? We all have these things in our life. We heard it worked for so-and-so, so so now I want to go do that thing because I want to be healed, fixed, etc., like Steve was or whatever. And that's what's going on with these invalids. They're getting so close to this water because they believe the water has something that's going to fix them. And so you and I in our own lives, we have to recognize we are trusting in other things to heal us. And so you have this profound situation where Jesus walks up to a man who's been laying on a mat for 38 years and he says one of the most offensive statements that you could possibly say to someone who is crippled, disabled, and invalid. Do you want to be healed? 
No, I had this funny picture. It's like, nah, nah, I'm good. I'm just going to lay here. You know what I mean? Like Jesus asked me, hey, do you want to know? I'm good, Jesus. I'd rather suffer. So why would Jesus ask this stupid question? Do you want to be healed? It's offensive. You know, in, in the modern culture, like, we don't have the ability, well, we have the ability, but culture is so offendable. Oh, that's offensive. Well, good, Jesus is offensive. And he offends a crippled man because he asks him, do you want to be healed? Like, we have to wrestle with that. You know, we think Jesus is, oh, bless your heart. I'm so sorry. Oh, my gosh, I feel so bad for you. Can I help you? That's not how Jesus acts here. Jesus says, do you want to be healed? And how does the man answer him? The man doesn't answer him. Do you want to be healed? What are the possible answers to that question? Go ahead. Yes, no, maybe so, right? What does the man say? So, but I have nobody to put me down into the pool when it's stirred up, and while I'm going, somebody steps down in front of me. Now, you have to think about this two ways. The guy's probably so caught off guard by Jesus, he doesn't know how to answer him. He says, do you want to be here? He's like, I, I mean, I, I can't get to the water. But then you can look at this and go, like, man, this guy's giving Jesus his excuses as to why he's not healed. You ever, you ever thought about this? Maybe you want God to come into your life and bring healing in a certain part, and you go, well, Lord, you know, I, I know what you're saying, but I'm just not that smart. I, I didn't go to college. You know, I, I don't know the Bible, Jesus. I, I, God, I don't understand Scripture. You know, I'm not a very religious person. I, you know, and, and Jesus is like, I didn't ask you that. I asked you, do you want to be healed? And so here's the challenge. What list of excuses are you giving Jesus as to why you're not answering the question he's asking you? We've got to get honest sometimes that Jesus is looking at us with a plain question and we're giving him a list of why it hadn't happened yet. Well, God, you know, I just don't really have enough money. I'm not like this person over here. Or, God, I'm just, like I said, not that smart. Or, I'm, I'm not really a, a business owner, God. Or, you know, I'm not ordained. I don't really have my, my, you know, degree from divinity school or whatever. And Jesus is going, stop giving me your excuses. Did you hear what I said? Do you want to be healed? Now, I think we have to reconcile this question. And I talk to a lot of people, and sometimes you have to look at them and go, do you actually want what Jesus has for you, or are you trying to come up with a list of excuses as to why you don't step into it? I love talking about this passage with people who are trying to find their purpose in their life, or they're trying to find their calling. And like, man, I... I'd love to play music, you know, but you just can't make money doing it. And I just, I don't know. I mean, my dad really wants me to be an attorney, but I just, I really just love music. Or what am I? Do you want to step into what Jesus has for you? Or are you stuck on all the excuses as why everybody around you is telling you that you can't or shouldn't do something? And this is what's going on in this passage, and it's so beautiful. And so then Jesus looks at the man and he says, get up. Take your mat and walk. Now, there are some times in our life where Jesus has to have that tough love for us, and he says, get up. You know, you're down here going, God, God, this is so hard. You know, you're laying down, and you're like, God, oh, God, I'm sorry, Lord. What? And he's like, get your butt up. Get up. You know, and, and we have all of these excuses as why we don't respond to the voice of Jesus that says, get up. I, I love my son. I bless him. I love him. He is like me on, you know, some type of drug. And he's the most exaggerated version of myself in the best ways and the worst ways. Right. And he'll probably watch this. But dad, why'd you talk about me? Um, but like the other day I said, you know, buddy, you just need to just to do this. 
And he's like, well, how do I do it? I said, just do it. Well, how do I do it? Just do it. You know, this is Jesus going, just get up. Get up. And this man has to get over and overcome his lack of faith. You see, the issue a lot of times with healing or deliverance or victory is that you and I don't actually believe that Jesus is who he says he is and he's good enough to do the things that he's asked us to do. And so participating with the Lord is having the faith to say, all right, I ain't walked on these legs in 38 years, but I'm going to try to stand up on them. And that's what happens. And the man gets up and he takes his mat and he walks away. Now, that's the physical side of this. That's one layer of the onion. And you're looking at this and you're going, okay, all right. I got to get over my excuses. I got to listen to Jesus. And I got to get up and I got to move forward, okay? That's level one. Time for level two. What happens after this? As soon as the man gets up, he's immediately attacked by the religious leaders. As soon as you start to step into God's breakthrough in your life, people are going to criticize you. As soon as you start to step into the healing that God has for you, the world is going to condemn you. As soon as you start to do something radically crazy for the Lord, people are going to start to throw rocks. What do they do to him? How dare you get up? Get back on that mat. Do you see what I'm saying? This is what they're doing to Jesus. I mean, to this man. They don't praise God that he was healed. They condemn him for being healed on the Sabbath. And they go, well, did you know that the oral tradition of Sabbath says you cannot carry your mat from one place to the other? You are breaking the law. And this man goes, yeah, bro, but look, my man, he's like, I'm, I'm healed. Do you see? Some people are so hung up on religion that they can't even see the miracle of God because it offends their mind and doesn't fit their agenda. Thank you. I got to amen. Yes, Amen. Do you understand that we live in a culture that is so indoctrinated in religion that they miss the miracles of God because it doesn't make sense to them, it offends them, or whatever else? So we have to go, man, am I that Pharisee? What about somebody who just got delivered from a heroin addiction? Well, I mean, you know, it's good and all, but you don't fall back into it. I mean, you probably need to go get a, a job and you need to do No, bless Jesus. Praise God. You know what I mean? A marriage that's healed. Well, you got make sure you probably want to, you know. No, we have to be so intent on what God's doing that when we see the work of God in the world, we want to jump on it. We want to embrace it, and we want to celebrate it. You see, these folks were so concerned with Sabbath that they missed Jesus. And, and here's the other beautiful part about this. I love this too. When Jesus runs into the fella, where does he run into the fella? In the temple. Which means what? He didn't run off and leave town. He had a humility in him. He's like, I was healed. And he went into the temple. So he went in to worship God. And he bumps into Jesus. Could you imagine what that been like? Oh, you're the, you're the man. You know what I mean? That healed me. And you know what? Jesus would have been like, hey, buddy, come in here, man. How are your legs working? You know what I mean? That's not what he says. He says, this is beautiful. Oh, you're well. <laughs> I love Jesus. It's, it's so funny to me. It's like, do you want to be healed? And then he sees him and goes, oh, you're well. Look what I did. You know, he doesn't do that. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. That's a hard passage of Scripture. And it implies that the man's condition was a result of sin. And I think in a Western uh, theological mindset, we feel like God punishes us 
for our sin. The word said the wages of sin is death. And yes, there are consequences to sin. But on the back end of the cross, our sin has been cleansed. And we've been washed clean. And so what Jesus is saying to him here, in my opinion, is, is, hey, make sure that you stay humble and you stay in relationship with you know, the Lord and don't fall into the trap of thinking that you got it figured out because the wages of sin are death. And there are consequences, right? So this isn't somebody pointing at you and say, you know, if you sin, you're going to get punished by God. That's not the Lord. The Lord says, I love you. I healed you. Go and sin no more. It's the same thing when Jesus gets down on his knee in front of the lady that's called an adultery. And he says, if any of you is without sin, go ahead and throw a stone at her. And those stones are thrown. He gets down, he looks at her in the face and he says, go and sin no more. This is an empowering reminder for us of how we need to steward what God has done in our lives. There's a lot of people who are like, boy, the Lord healed me, you know, he healed me, and all this, and they just want to talk and talk and talk and talk and talk about it, and that's great, but you got to be careful at who's getting the credit here. A lot of times people like to talk about their victories and their healings as a way to elevate themselves instead of elevating the God who healed them. And I think that's the key reminder here. These are the spiritual lessons that are underneath this. These are the deeper points that we have to dive in in our own hearts and say, okay, Lord, help me see this. And, and this is, is kind of where I want to wrap this piece up with and, and really bring home. This is the, the center of this passage. This is that gold nugget. This is what I really think is going on in the Scripture here. So we have the physical nature. We have this kind of responsiveness. Then we have this, I mean, physical nature. Yeah, then the spiritual nature. And now we're kind of getting the big picture here, okay? Everybody still with me? We still good? Okay, cool. Paint's getting sprayed everywhere. Y'all hang with me. All right. Here's what's beautiful about this. The big picture of Scripture is when you have the humility to read yourself into the story. I think a lot of times we look at this passage and we go, God healed that guy. Well, that's the Pharisee. Oh, I know who that Pharisee is. You know who I'm talking about. They're the ones that's always condemning, da 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 the, the powerful part here is where we begin to see the bigger picture. So let me share a couple things with you. Verse 5. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. Why would that matter? 38 years. Is 38 years significant to anybody? Do you all recognize anything about 38 years? After God delivered the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, how many years did they wander in the wilderness? How many are we told? 40. Deuteronomy 2, verse 14. Uh, is it 2, 14? My, there it is. And the time from our leaving Kadesh Barnea until we crossed the brook of Zered was 38 years. Until the entire generation, that is the men of war, had perished from the camp as the Lord, Lord sworn of them. It's interesting. We're always told 40 years, right? But if you really break down the Exodus journey, they camped for two years before they spent their 38 years in the wilderness. Now, when I read that, buddy, the Holy Spirit just took me on a journey. 38 years is significant here. Why? This was a man who was healed by Jesus. But you know what this is a greater picture of? God's people broken, crippled, 
and blind, wandering without him for 38 years until they have an encounter with the one true God that ultimately brings them healing. You see, here's the reality. You and me, we're the crippled guy. We're broken. We're crippled. We're lame. And we're laying by a pool that is the world's solution to our problems. And we're blaming everything and everybody around us as to why we aren't being healed. We're looking for healing in the wrong place. We are the crippled man. And Jesus asked us the same question he asks him. Do you want to be healed? Here's the beautiful picture about this scripture. Where is the pool located? The sheep gate. Why does that matter? The sheep gate is where the sacrificial lambs were brought to be crucified on the altar. And here we have the sacrificial lamb, Jesus himself, walking through the sheep gate, telling an invalid people, I'm the lamb. I can heal you. I will heal you. All you are like sheep who've gone astray, right? Where are the crippled wandering? By the sheep gate. And here comes the good shepherd. Oh, are you ready for this? What did Jesus say that he had that if we drank of, we'd never be thirsty? Living water, right? See, Jesus comes to us and he says, I know you want that water. You need my water. I know your sheep that have gone astray. I'm the good shepherd. Do you want to be healed? And he's not looking for our excuses. He's not looking for our sympathies. He's simply looking for our heart. And here's the beautiful part about this scripture. You know when he did this? On Sabbath. And that messed up the religious leaders because they said, you can't do this on Sabbath. Jesus said, watch me. Jesus looks at a broken and lame generation who is looking for rest. That's Sabbath. We want rest. We want peace. And we're crippled, laying by water, looking for worldly answers to where we get that rest and that peace from. And guess what? The religious people were no different. They were looking for rest and peace in their own duties and in their own laws and, and following all the rules and keeping up all the righteous duties. And Jesus looks at the religious leaders and at the crippled people, and he says, both of you are looking for rest in the wrong place. Here I am. This, this particular passage is so profound to me because it is Jesus telling the people, I am the rest you long for. When you're wandering in the wilderness, I am your promised land. I am your manna. I am the bread from heaven. I am your peace. I am your provision. And so the question we have is how do we respond to the words of Jesus that says, do you want to be healed? You notice this man didn't have to do anything to receive the healing that Jesus gave him. He just had to participate in it. He had to agree. In a world that's told us we have to earn the blessing of God, I want you to hear today 
that we just have to receive it. But that means we have to put our crippled mindset aside. We have to put our crippled perspective aside. And we have to begin to participate with what it is that God is inviting us into in our lives. And so to a world out, outside that is lost and looking for healing and looking for rest and looking for peace, they need to see themselves as a the crippled man at the pool who just responds to the words of Jesus, do you want to be healed? And so friends, I would encourage you today that the big picture here is to read yourself into the story the way I need to read myself into the story. I am in need of the rest of Jesus, the healing of Jesus. And I just have to participate by responding to his question and his request. Get up, take your mat, and walk. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Lord, for your, your word, which is so powerful, Lord. It says it's a sword, double-edged, and it pierces bone from marrow, soul from spirit. Thank you for piercing us today. And God, no matter where we are, if we're laying by the pool, uh, physically, metaphorically, um, if we are somewhere today, Lord, and we're looking to other things to heal us, help us encounter you who is our healing, who is our victory, who is our peace. And let us not give excuses, but instead step into relationship with you to get up, take our mat, and walk.